It is day 359 of reading and studying through the Bible in 365. My name is Kanoi. Welcome to Bible study. Well, hello, friends. I hope you had a wonderful Christmas. I know we are still one day behind, but don't you worry. We will get caught up. I have been traveling between islands, between families, of course, having our family day all day on Christmas, so I didn't have a lot of time to be able to catch up. It will happen, though. I am traveling once again back to my home, so as I spend the time on the airplane, I will make sure I get caught up in my reading, and we will make sure that we are on schedule to finish the Bible in 2023. So it will happen. Please don't have any anxiety about it, but I do encourage you to continue in your reading, continue in your studying so that when we do have videos that come out, you will be ready and prepared when that time does come. In the meantime, if you could please help us out, if you had a wonderful Christmas, if you love Jesus and if you love the word of God and you love coming to Bible study, if you could please just hit the little like button, that would be a wonderful way to partner with us and saying, hey, you know what? We want to be able to help in sharing the gospel and getting it out to people around the world because that does help us. Also, subscribing to the channel, hitting that notification bell also does the same thing, but it helps you too so that you know whenever Bible study is ready for you. Also, make sure you check out our website, heartdive.org, so that you know all of the details that are coming up for 2024 as we get ready and prepared for Heart Dive 365, where we are diving into the Word of God and once again, completing the entire Bible in one year. So we are starting off here in 2 Peter. We're going to complete this book as well as the book of Jude. And then, like I said, I will come back with day 360 and 361, hopefully in the next video. But let's go ahead and pray, prepare our hearts as we get into the word. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this beautiful day. Thank you, Jesus, once again, as we come out of the celebration of Christmas. May we never lose sight or even take for granted any day, Lord, that you were born, that you came, that you died for us, that you rose again. We thank you so much for that. Thank you for being our Lord and Savior. Thank you that you even chose to do what you did so that we could have eternal life. We are eternally grateful for that, Lord. And I just pray for every person who is here today, Lord, that they will be able to experience you in a new way. I pray that you will be so evident to them, not only through your word, but just through your presence. Holy Spirit, will you just dwell within each and every one of us? I pray, Lord, that you will fall down like fire. I pray that your wind will blow and that we will be filled afresh today by the reading of your word. May our faith be strengthened, Lord, and I just pray that we will learn something new. May our eyes, ears, and hearts be open only to your truth, not to deception. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you will speak through me, that there will be no words of falsehood, God, but that you will give me all words of truth and inerrancy just as your word has spoken. Help us to stay focused on what is most important, Lord, and not get distracted by the things that the enemy it may try to bring our way. And I just pray that you will be glorified in every thought, every deed, every action, Lord, as we go throughout our week, our day, and even throughout the rest of the year. Help us to finish strong, Lord. Give us new joy, new mercies today. We are grateful for it, that those things are refreshed every day and that we always have them in our hearts, God. As you dwell within, that peace continues to dwell as well. So we thank you, Prince of Peace, for being here among us. We cast all other anxieties and worries unto your throne, knowing that you will deal with them and that we can fully trust in you, that everything that you are doing is going to work out for good. So we love you, Lord. Forgive us of our sins. Help us to forgive others. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So back in Peter, his epistle. So 2 Peter here, written somewhere between AD 64 and 68, possibly written from Rome. Of course, he is the author, the audience being the widely scattered Christians in the Asia Minor. So these are mostly Gentile Christians. And he is once again addressing false teaching and emphasizing holy living. This epistle is actually very similar to Jude. So we are going to read Jude and some people saying that, oh, we wonder if, you know, either Peter wrote Jude or Jude wrote Peter, or if these two borrowed from each other. We really don't know. It doesn't really matter. The main thing that matters is, is that the word that was spoken, we know was from God himself. So we start off here in chapter one with a greeting from Peter. Simeon Peter, notice he uses both of his names. The first name, either Simeon or Simon, however you want to refer to him, meant shifting sand, but Jesus 
changed his name to Peter, which means rock, which comes from the Greek term Petros. So Simeon Peter's servant and apostle of Jesus. So he calls himself a servant first, which is the Greek word doulos, which is a servant who actually wished to remain for life with his master. So remember at the end of service, they could decide if they wanted to stay with that master or if they wanted to be sold off. And if they stayed, they would have to put an earring through their ear, which would declare them as now owned. And the master would then be responsible to take care of this servant. So that's how he is referring to himself of Christ, but also as an apostle, an authorized spokesman. To those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours by the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So he's essentially putting himself on the same level as every other Christian saying, we all have access by the righteousness of God to that faith. So by the justification, the fact that we have been saved, we are all on equal ground. We all have the same standing with him. So Peter is recalling not only where he comes from, but also to whom he belongs or to who he belongs. He belongs to him. So that would be whom. (laughs) I always get confused with those two. So we are the righteousness of Christ. And that is why we too are also able to stand on that same holy ground. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God. By the way, this will be the biggest term of this epistle, knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. So remember, grace and peace were typical greetings that they would often use, grace being from the Greek greeting and then peace being a Hebrew greeting, shalom. His divine power, meaning the power that rose Jesus from the dead, has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. So all things means he's already given us everything that we need in order to live an abundant life. So by that power, he's given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. So we have been called and we have the knowledge of the one who called us by which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises. So we all have great promise in our lives so that through them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped from the corruption or the moral ruin of the world that is in the world because of sinful desire. For this very reason, Make every effort to supplement your faith, meaning to add to your faith with virtue. So virtue being your morality or your godly character, and then add virtue with knowledge, meaning that practical wisdom that we learn from the word, and with knowledge with self-control, self-control being the ability to master your own emotions and to be able to master your flesh, and self-control with steadfastness, steadfastness being that endurance or that patience, and steadfastness with love, of course, love encompassing all things. So if you want a form of godliness, we've got to be continuing continually aware of God's presence in our lives and live for him. And so if you have these qualities, if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they will keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted, meaning you're spiritually blind, and that having forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. So whenever you become spiritually blind, you forget what Jesus has done for you, become forgetful, and therefore you can no longer see past what is right in front of you. You won't be able to see the eternal. You won't be able to see what's ahead. You will be so short-sighted, and these are typically people who are materially motivated, only concerned about the present life instead of being more concerned about what is to come in eternity. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. Some translations say to make sure or make your election sure, your calling sure, your salvation sure. For if you practice these qualities, you will never fall. So if you have all of these things that we just talked about, you will be sure that you will be saved as long as you remain in that love of Christ. For in this way, there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So basically, you're not going to just barely scrape in there. (laughs) You will walk into an abundance of eternal rewards. Therefore, I intend always to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. So there is a purpose in the constant reminding. That's why we read the Bible over and over again. That's why we continue to repeat things over and over again, because it is important. Otherwise, we become negligent. So repetition is key. 
I think it right as long as I am in this body, so as long as I'm alive, to stir you up by the way of reminder, since I know that the putting off of my body, meaning once I die, because he knows he's soon going to die, will be soon as our Lord Jesus Christ made clear to me. And I will make every effort so that after my departure, you may be able at any time to recall these things, how it will be through his testimony and most likely his testimony through the gospel of Mark, because he had a really big influence on Mark's gospel. So he is stressing here that it's not so much about what you know, but how well you know what you know. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. So we did not listen to those who said that the resurrection, the return of Jesus, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit are all simply mythical ideas, but instead he's saying, hello, we saw me, James, John, were at the transfiguration. We saw his glory. For when we received honor and glory from God, the Father, and the voice was born to him by the majestic glory at the transfiguration, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, he said. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of scripture comes from someone else's or someone's own interpretation. So he's saying, in light of the fact that we were eyewitnesses, let me give you something even more powerful. It was the fulfilling of the prophetic, and it will be the word of God, this lamp shining in a dark place that will continue to point you to the source of the truth until he comes back, until he returns. And he is saying no prophecy ever came from just one person. There are no private sources in the Bible. The prophets didn't provide commentary whenever they spoke the word of God. They simply spoke whatever it was that the Holy Spirit had given them to speak, and that's it. Therefore, it needs to be taken as truth. And he says, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And every single one of those prophecies, every single word that God speaks fits together. And that is why we need to know the entire word. Because if you only cherry pick prophecies or scriptures here and there, you're not going to understand how they interlock with other scripture. And when you isolate it, you can so easily twist it to fit your own agenda or your own thoughts. And that is why he's making that point that no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but by God. And so we have to know all of these prophetic words and how they fit properly together so we can get the proper understanding of them. I know he's been talking a lot about that lately. So we'll continue here in chapter two about false prophets and teachers. But false prophets also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly, so they're not going to openly say, hey, here's some false teaching for you today, bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So these are going to be Christians who are living shameful and deliberately immoral lives. But because people are going to be so deceived by it, they're not even going to recognize it. And many will follow their sensuality because that's that carnal nature. So they're going to say, you know what? I'm going to follow them. They're Christian, but their way of living is much better. And because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle and their destruction is not asleep. So this isn't just a thing of the past. It's going to continue. And we need to be warned of this even today. There are still people like this in the church even. For if God did not spare angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of gloomy darkness to be kept until the judgment, if he didn't spare the angels, ancient world, but preserve Noah, a herald of righteousness with seven others when he brought a flood upon the world of the ungodly. If by turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah to ashes, he condemned them to extinction, making them an example of what is going to happen to the ungodly. And if he rescued righteous Lot, greatly distressed by the sensual conduct of the wicked, for as the righteous man lived among them day after day, he was tormented his righteous soul over their lawless deeds that he saw and heard. Then the Lord knows how to rescue 
rescue the godly from trials and to keep the unrighteous under punishment until the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge in the lust of defiling passion and despise authority. So in this big, long sentence here, he is basically saying there will be consequences for those who are unrighteous and ungodly. So the wheels of his judgment may turn slowly, but trust me, they grind thoroughly. So it will happen. So he's saying just the same way that he did back then and judged all of this unrighteousness, he's going to do it again. And when he was talking about these angels up here, by the way, these were either, and this is highly debated, the fallen angels who fell with Satan, or these were the sons of God who were the angels who rebelled against God and slept with the women, slept with humans in Genesis chapter six. So it could be either or, but regardless, both of them held to judgment. But he is also in the same breath saying, those who are righteous though, will be delivered the same way that he rescued Lot. So bold and willful, or in other words, presumptuous and self-willed, they do not even tremble as they blaspheme the glorious ones, meaning either those in authority over them or even the angels. Whereas angels, though greater in might and power, they don't even pronounce a blasphemous judgment against them before the Lord. So the angels, the good angels, don't even speak against them. But these, like irrational animals, creatures of instinct, born to be caught and destroyed, blaspheming about matters of which they are ignorant, will also be destroyed in their destruction, suffering wrong as the wage for their wrongdoing. So these are people who are living openly, flaunting their sin. They don't even consider the consequences. They count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are blots and blemishes re reveling in their deceptions while they feast with you. They have eyes full of adultery, insatiable for sin, meaning their sin is so habitual that they can't even stop. Like it's insatiable. They entice unsteady souls. They have hearts trained in greed, accursed children, forsaking the right way they have gone astray. They have followed the way of Balaam. Remember, Balaam is the one who sold his prophetic power. He was wanting to curse Israel, even though he couldn't, remember, in the end. The son of Beor, who loved gain from wrongdoing, but was rebuked for his own transgression. A speechless donkey spoke with human voice and restrained the prophet's madness. Remember, the donkey was like, why are you doing that? Now, these are the waterless springs meaning they are bringing false expectations. They're stirring up a whole lot of things, but really no substance and mist driven by a storm. For them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. For speaking loud boasts of folly, they enticed by sensual passions of the flesh, those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of their own corruption or sin. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved." For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. So basically, they would have been better off having never even heard of Jesus or the gospel or anything like that, because now they're going to be worse off now that they will be held accountable for the fact that they knew the truth and they blatantly disobeyed it. What the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing herself returns to wallow in the mire. So remember the dog and the pigs were the lowliest of animals. So these false teachers, these people who are coming in and deceiving the innocent and the unsuspecting, they are unable to even be righteous at all. And like I said, these are people who can possibly even be in places of ministry and authority and they will do wrong and I'm sorry, I'm sorry, but then they will go right back to doing the same thing over and over again. And it's not just people in church. I mean, this is just speaking in general of those who are deceptive and who are false teachers. Chapter three. So now he's going to address skepticism and cynicism. This is now the second letter that I am writing to you. Now, some people say, oh, of course, because it's second Peter, but actually other scholars believe that this is probably a second letter and the first one was lost because this letter is referring to the reminders that he is giving. Whereas first Peter wasn't so much the reminder 
Uh, so they think that there was actually another letter. But regardless, this is the second letter that I'm writing to you, beloved. In both of them, I am stirring up your sincere mind by way of reminder that you should remember the predictions of the holy prophets and the commandment of the Lord to love one another and Savior through your apostles, knowing this, first of all, that scoffers will come in the last days with scoffing, following their own sinful desires. They will say, Where's the promise of his coming? For ever since the fathers fell asleep, all things are continuing as if they were from the beginning of creation. So basically like, hello, you said Jesus was returning. He hasn't yet. So why are you even still expecting it to happen? It's never happened before. Why will it happen now? For they deliberately overlook this fact that the heavens existed long ago and the earth was formed out of water and through water by the word of God. So hello, they forgot that God is our creator and that by means of these, the world that then existed was deluged by, with water and perished. But by the same word, the heavens and earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. So they are forgetting that our creator who destroyed the earth by the flood is going to do it once again, but this time by fire. And they're not even looking to that. And notice that it is all by his word that there was creation, there was the sustaining of the world, but also judgment and destruction that will take place by his word. But do not overlook this one fact, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is as a thousand years and a thousand years as one day. So he is not held to our idea of time is basically what this is saying. It's not saying that, one day is technically 1,000 years exact. <laughs> the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. So his timing, no matter what it looks like, it is perfect. And he has so much mercy and so much grace, and his patience is long-suffering, meaning he's going to wait a very long time. But once he finally puts that hammer down, he's done waiting, right? So he is not slow to fulfill the promise, but he's just waiting, giving us a chance to be able to come to repentance because he wants everyone to do so. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief, especially for the unbelievers. And then the heavens will pass away with a roar and the heavenly bodies will be burned up and dissolved and the earth and the works that are done on it will be exposed. Now, if we want to bring a little reality to this, I'm not saying that this is how it will happen, but it makes the most sense. How will this happen so quickly? It could possibly be nuclear. You know, if you think about nuclear weapons, nuclear war, if anything is going to come with a roar, burn everything up, dissolve everything in its path, and everything will be exposed. I mean, literally exposing the flesh and bones of people. Nuclear makes sense, right? I don't want to scare anybody, but I mean, we're just being truthful here and we're keeping our eyes open to the reality of the word of God. That makes the most sense. Since all these things are thus to be dissolved, what sort of people ought you to live in lives of holiness and godliness? Yes, please. Waiting for and hastening the coming of the day of God. Can we really hasten the coming of the day of God? Well, I mean, if you think about it, we play a role in what will happen, right? Like our prayers that are spoken. God knows what those prayers are before we ever even speak them, but they all play a part in whatever happens on this earth. So we should be people who are praying, Lord, your kingdom come. You know, we also are witness to the fact that these things are going to happen, that all of this prophetic word was fulfilled and that these prophecies are still yet to come. So we should be witnessing so that we can get people saved because remember, he's waiting for that last person to get saved before he comes back. Because of which the heavens will be set on fire and dissolved and the heavenly bodies will melt as they burn. But according to his promise, we are waiting for the new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So instead of just working for things on this earth that are going to pass away, we should be working toward the eternal, toward that fourth day. Now, if you want to look at some of the days of the Lord, there was the day of man, which was basically in the garden of Eden until the fall of man. Then we have the day of Christ, which is referring to the rapture. There will be the day of the Lord, which will be the time from the tribulation through the millennium. And then the day of God will be after the millennium when the great judgment happens and the new heaven and new earth 
is revealed. Therefore, beloved, since you are waiting for these, be diligent to be found by him without spot or blemish and at peace. Now, I know some people would stop here and say, oh boy, if he finds me, I'm definitely not without spot or blemish. But when we are found in him, abiding in him, then we are therefore found without spot or blemish. Like if we are abiding in him, our father is going to say, oh, there you are, my child. And who is he going to see? He's not going to see us in all of our spots and blemishes. He's going to see his son. He's going to see Jesus. So whenever we abide in Jesus and Jesus abides in us or dwells within us, that's who the father sees. So that's how we want to be found. So don't leave him. Don't leave his side. Allow him to dwell within you so that you can be found there and you will be at peace because that Prince of Peace dwells within. And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters when he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. And I kind of chuckled at this because I was like, wow, Peter, way to keep it real, you know, and it made me feel a little bit better because for those of us who struggled through some of Paul's letters and run on sentences, then you will feel a little better that Peter also struggled to understand them. But I couldn't help but wonder, like, is this a little bit of a dig at Paul? I don't know. But really, if we look at it through grace-filled eyes, we could say this is the Lord really just saying there is goodness in diversity in the way people teach differently. You know, not everybody's going to come to this Bible study and say, that's for me. A lot of people are like, she's annoying, don't like her voice, don't like the way she studies. I'm not going to stay here. And that's fine. And then others will say, that's that's my kind of people. I like the way she explains things. I'm going to stick here. You know, so there's goodness in diversity. Everybody's different. Everybody learns differently, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. So those who do not understand the word of God, they will be the ones who remain in ignorance and therefore they will twist the word of God to be able to fit their own agenda as they do the other scriptures. You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand, so the fact that you know that there are people who are going to twist the scripture to fit how they want it to sound, take care that you are not carried away with the error of lawless people and lose your own stability. So be careful when you start hearing things that take you away from the gospel, the fact that you have heard this word and you know very well that they're going to be people who try to allure you into their way of thinking, just be careful, you know, pray about it, pray for discernment, Pray that the Lord reveals to you, Holy Spirit, his whisper will be greater than anything they could ever say to you. So he will let you know, but grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, both now and to the day of eternity. Amen. And now we'll turn over to Jude, who obviously is the author of Jude likely written sometime between AD 60 and 64. And Jude is actually James's brother or the half brother of Jesus. And so, like I said earlier, this is very similar. You will hear very similar themes and words being spoken here in Jude as spoken in second Peter. So they may have borrowed the words from each other. It's not a bad thing. We should be borrowing words of righteousness from each other. Audience again, being Christians, a purpose to address the false teachers, to defend the faith and to grow in grace, which is what Peter ended with in his epistle. So Jude, a servant of Jesus Christ and brother of James. Notice he doesn't say, I'm Jesus's brother. No, he says, I'm James's brother and I'm a servant of Jesus. To those who are called, beloved in God, the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. So we are called and beloved. May mercy, peace, and love be multiplied to you. I receive that, Jude. Thank you. (laughs) So mercy being that undeserved favor and peace being that ability to rest in God for salvation and protection. So here says judgment on false teachers. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, meaning the unity of all of the church. So he's like, this was supposed to be a celebratory letter. I found it necessary instead to write appealing to you to contend for the faith instead that was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain people have crept in unnoticed who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only master and Lord Jesus Christ. So these are people who are loosely living. They are wolves in sheep, sheep's clothing. Now I want to remind you, which by the way, Jesus warned us of these kinds of people. Now I want to remind you, although you once fully knew it, 
that Jesus, who saved a people out of the land of Egypt, afterward destroyed those who did not believe. So he's like, you were warned. And the angels, and these are the same ones that we were referring to earlier, either the fallen angels or those sons of God who slept with humans, who did not stay within their own position of authority, but left their proper dwelling. He has kept in eternal chains under gloomy darkness until the judgment of the great day. Just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Yet in like manner, these people also relying on their dreams. So they are not people who are called. They're not commissioned. They are simply relying on their own idea that they are spiritual. Defile the flesh. They reject authority and they blaspheme the glorious ones. So they are not only demeaning to Christians, but also to those in authority. But when the archangel Michael contending with the devil was disputing about the body of Moses, which by the way, this story is not in the Bible, but it is out of the book of the Assumption of Moses, uh, which was, I believe, written in the first century. So not part of the Bible, but Jude is referring to this book about when Michael and Satan were fighting over the body of Moses. He did not presume to pronounce a blasphemous judgment, but instead said, the Lord rebuke you. So notice, and I thought this was interesting because this actually checked my heart like, whoa, are we actually not supposed to kind of speak against the devil? I mean, even the archangel Michael did it. Like he called upon the Lord to rebuke the devil, you know, but, but we also think about the way Jesus dealt with the enemy and that we have that authority. And so I don't know, I, I would say if anything, keep Jesus between you and the devil. I mean, that's the most important thing, right? It's not trying to take him on, on our own or by our own strength and power. It is always keeping the Lord between you and him. But these people blaspheme all that they do not understand. And they are destroyed by all that they, like unreasoning animals, understand instinctively. Woe to them, for they walked in the way of Cain. So we are going to see three people here who Jude is referring to as failures in the Old Testament. And that's basically what these people are like. So we had the way of Cain and abandoned themselves for the sake of gain to Balaam's error and perished in Korah's rebellion. So let's just stop here for a moment on these three figures here. Cain, who acted out of his own anger, didn't put his faith in God, but instead was prideful and self-righteous. So that's one person. So anger, self-righteousness, and pride. Uh, Balaam, remember who sold out, was trying to get a prophet in order to curse Israel from Balak. And his major sin was actually greed or his failure was greed. And then there was Korah, who was a Levite who actually rebelled against Moses and Aaron's authority. And so he was like envious and jealous. So those are the things that you need to watch out for in these people. Anger, pride, self-righteousness, greed, envy, jealousy. These are hidden reefs. Again, they're not going to be waltzing in saying, I'm a false teacher. No, they're going to be underground, undetected, not seen at the surface, but underneath they're stirring up the waves at your love feasts as they feast with you without fear. So they are going to be bold in their ability to be able to prey on people who are weak. Shepherds feeding themselves. So they are all about their own gain. Waterless clouds. So again, no substance swept along by winds, fruitless trees in late autumn. So they really will produce no good fruit. Twice dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea. So they are causing a lot of motion. They're erratic, wasting a whole lot of energy, but really not getting anything done, casting up the foam of their own shame. So eventually they are going to fall wandering stars. So they may seem like really amazing at first, you know, they might come in shining bright, but eventually as soon as things don't go their way, they're going to fall and they're going to quickly grow dim for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. So once they burn out, they're basically going to move on to the next unsuspecting group. I've seen this happen. I mean, to the T it's crazy. 
but he is saying they will be held accountable. They will be punished. It was also about these that Enoch, the seventh from Adam, prophesied, saying, behold, the Lord comes with 10,000s of his holy ones. And this is basically a Hebrew word that means limitless amount of holy ones to execute judgment on all and to convict all the ungodly of all their deeds of ungodliness that they have committed in such an ungodly way and all of the harsh things that the ungodly sinners have spoken against him. So notice how many times he says ungodly. Like, let's get this right here. These guys were ungodly. They had ungodliness. They were living in an ungodly way. And they are simply ungodly sinners. Okay, so they may, may be among you, but they are far from godly. And by the way, this is a quote that comes from the book of Enoch, which also not in the Bible. So he's saying, this is what you will see. Here's how you'll know them. These are grumblers, malcontents, following their own sinful desires. They are loudmouth boasters, showing favoritism to gain advantage. So they're basically selfish. They complainers. They're arrogant. They're going to try to gain a following and they're going to be bucking up against authority. So everything is going to be for their own selfish gain. But you must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time, there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. It is the these who cause divisions, worldly people, devoid of the spirit, but you, beloved, building yourselves up in your most holy faith. So he's basically saying, here's how you are able to resist them. Praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God. This is what it all hinges upon right here. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So how do we build ourselves up in the faith? Well, of course, that's going to be in the word. That's how we build our faith, right? Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God, praying in the spirit. There are different ways of looking at this. One, it is allowing the Holy Spirit to guide your prayers instead of just demanding your own way the entire time. Two, it is groaning, allowing your spirit to just simply groan. You know, you don't know the words to speak, but you know that there is some passion going on in there and you just allow it to groan before the Lord. Or third, it would be the praying in tongues, praying in the spirit, heavenly prayer language, and have mercy on those who doubt save others by snatching them out of the fire. So not everyone's going to be dealt with the same. You know, those who may have been a little bit weak and were innocent in the matter, but kind of fell weak to this deception, you know, have mercy on them. But you might have to just take somebody else by the shoulders and snatch them away. So not everyone is dealt with the same. You have to have discernment on that. Show others mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by flesh. So basically stay wary of sin, save the sinner, burn the garments. Now to him who is able, of course, we know there's only one who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. So the only one who can present us as blameless and unblemished is Jesus. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Everybody shout a big amen to that. To him be all glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. So from the beginning of time through eternity, amen and amen. So once again, we end here with this reminder or warning. Stay in the word, pray in the spirit, watch for mercy, look for Jesus in everything. This is how you stay in the love of God. So we just thank you, Father, as we near the end of this year. Thank you so much, Lord, for this bold reminder today to not only stay in your love, but to understand how important it is for us to obtain knowledge. For in doing so, Lord, we know that we will begin to experience grace and peace, and not just for ourselves, but grace for us to have on other people, for that to continue to increase within us. And Lord, I pray that we will do all that we can to add to our faith, that godly character and that practical wisdom and self-control, that patience, that endurance, that godliness, but most of all, love, Lord, love for you and love for other people. I pray these things will only continue to increase within us so that we can be effective and useful 
bearing fruit in every season. Because we don't want to be so nearsighted, Lord, that we completely miss the vision that you have instilled in us before the beginning of time. We want to be able to see ahead. We want to have our eyes fixed on the eternal. May we always remember the grace and the forgiveness that you poured out into us in the past, but that still continues to overflow today. And we know, Lord, that when we remember, we will be all the more diligent to make our election and our calling sure. We know that if we can maintain these things, God, that we will not falter. And so I pray that you will help us to stand strong in them. We don't want to just barely scrape by, Lord, but we want to be able to be bold in knowing that we will enter into a kingdom of abundance. So once again, Lord, protect our minds from deceitful people, from teachings that are false. Continue to fill us with truth, the whole truth, Lord, not just salad bar mentality. Help us to be even more discerning in these last days of those who might declare godliness, but are completely living in denial of your power. May we grow in grace and knowledge and bring you all the glory, Lord, each and every day, so that when you do return, we won't be caught off guard, but we will be found blameless and spotless, knowing full well that we are covered in your righteousness. So I pray, Lord, that today, mercy and grace and peace will truly be multiplied to every single person who is here in your presence, studying your word, and longing to know you more and more. We love you, Lord Jesus. We pray these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. Heaven and salvation is a divine gift that is given to us by grace. None of us deserve it. In fact, the Bible says that the wages of sin is death, and every single one of us have fallen short, and then we desperately need someone to pay that price. And Jesus did it. He didn't do it because we are righteous on our own merit. He did it because he loves us and he wants to spend eternity with us. But it won't happen if we don't receive him before we leave this earth as Lord and Savior. Hell is a very real thing and there is no second chance after we take our last breath here. So I want to be able to give someone the opportunity today who is saying, I'm ready. I've never given my life to Christ. I don't know where I'm going to end up after I die. But I don't want to live another day without knowing beyond a shadow of a doubt where I am going to end up. I see now that this is real and I want to believe. So if that is you, we're going to say a prayer and I'm going to put the words on the screen so that you can say them audibly with your mouth because the Bible says that when you believe and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and that he died and rose again, then you will be saved. So we're going to say this prayer together. Believe it in your heart, speak it with your mouth, and know that this is indeed the day of your salvation. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. I believe that you came, you died, and you rose again. I confess my sins to you today, and I turn from them, and I now live my life for you. I know that I am forgiven of all my sins, so I receive you now, as Lord and Savior, and I belong to you, Jesus. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.